my church. And I'm so glad that you could be here. Um, I want to thank the church board firstly just for allowing me the opportunity to share with you this week. Um, I also wanted to say thanks um, to those who support me and pray for me who encourage me each day. Um, I really appreciate that. Um, so I want to start with a question. Who loves a good story? Last time I spoke, I spoke, sorry, I didn't see your ass right now. <laughs> Last time I spoke, I mentioned the story about taking a journey to Milan with Jesse. Uh, well, today I'm going to tell you about another journey, but this time it was to America. At the beginning of this month, I was blessed with the opportunity to attend and participate in General Assembly in Indianapolis, Indiana. And I can tell you that this time it was a much longer journey than just heading to Milan in four hours. This trip took me 26 hours, two planes, two trains, and a bus to get there. Um, I had the opportunity to meet people from many parts of the world, and that was such a blessing. But also a highlight was seeing those who I spend a lot of time with each week in person through an email or a Zoom call, but hanging out in a different environment, um, that was fun as well. It was so amazing to meet people who are doing different type, same types of ministry that we are all a part of but they're doing it in a completely different cultural context. There were so many differences between us all, from speaking to different languages or the different cultural backgrounds that we made. But despite our differences, we were all celebrating to coming together after six years since the last one, all declaring as the theme of that General Assembly was Jesus is Lord. Being with over 12,000 Nazarenes in one place gives a great opportunity to talk and especially listen to so many stories of her, but also redemption. One story that I heard was mentioned in the first of the many worship services that we did. This story was about a pastor in Africa. I can't exactly say what country he was from or his name, but to make the story easier um, to explain, I'm going to call him John. Now this story starts with John as he was on, his bu on the bus with his wife, who I'm calling Jill as well to help us make it easier. John and Jill were on the bus in that evening as they were getting home after a trip out for the day. Whilst on the journey, they came to a stop as there was an armed roadblock ahead. A group of men with guns then came in and boarded the bus and they demanded that all the men get off the bus with all their belongings. But they left the women and children to stay home. If you're imagining yourself in the story just at this point as we take a quick pause, I'm sure being pulled off by armed men that you would be scared. John was so afraid, and he prayed to God that God would intervene in this situation and protect him. The armed men started searching through all the captured men's items. The men with guns then started looking through everyone's phones, and they were looking to see if they had any evidence that would give them a reason to shoot the owners of the phones. I'm sure John knew, as a pastor, if they saw anything on his phone, they would likely have a reason to find to shoot John. But when the men got to John's phone, it was suddenly out of battery. And so they had nothing to put against John. So John was let go and he was able to return uh, to jail on the bus and make the journey home. John continues to lead a successful church that is growing as a result of his faith and in his trust in Christ, even when he was so close to death. This was just one of many stories from General Assembly that were told from the lives of our Nazarene brothers and sisters across the globe. I've heard so many other stories that reminded me of God's faithfulness and this beautiful journey of grace we get to travel with God. In the story, there's always a beginning, a middle, and an end. In our spiritual walk with Christ, it also has three parts of a beginning, middle, and end. But the part we think of as the beginning isn't actually the beginning, but possibly the middle, in God's eyes. I'm sure we can remember when our spiritual journey with Christ began. Today we're going to be looking at Acts chapter 10, and we're going to be looking at a man named Cornelius and his journey of grace. This is a long chapter, so I'm going to quickly summarize the first 33 verses to give us some context before we read. I would encourage you to read the whole chapter, though, in your own time. Cornelius is a Roman centurion who lives in Caesarea. As a soldier of the Roman Empire, he would be a pagan intruder in the eyes of God's people in Caesarea. 
But as we are introduced to him, we are told that he is a devout man who fears God, gives generously to others, and prays often. One day as Cornelius prays, God comes to him through an angel and tells him to summon a man from Joppa named Peter. The angel even gives him the address where Peter is staying. So Cornelius sends his servants to go and fetch Peter. As they were on their way to treat Peter, God goes ahead of Peter to prepare him for the visit of Cornelius. Peter is not yet ready for the encounter. Peter has gone up on the rooftop of the house in Joppa where he is staying to pray and God is waiting for him there. When Peter's stomach suggests that it's time to eat, God offers him a vision, that of a sheep being lured toward him, full of animals, reptiles and birds, all of which have been previously declared unclean and unlawful for devout Jewish people to eat. In the vision, a voice tells Peter to get up, kill the creatures and eat them. Being the holy man that he is, Peter refuses because he knows God's law, and he is not willing to break it, which would indicate that Peter believes that he is being tested in some way or another. The voice suggests that Peter should consider one thing. If God is putting it on the table, maybe it's not Peter's place to categorize it as unclean. The interaction happens three times between verses 9 and 16. What we can see is that God's grace is persistent. As Peter starts scratching his head on the roof, trying to make sense of what has ha just happened, Cornelius' men appear at the front gate at that exact moment and ask for him. The Spirit comes upon Peter and tells Peter to listen to them and go with them because they were sent by the Spirit. Peter obeys and the men tell him about Cornelius and Peter invites him to stay with him for the night. Peter is already breaking Jewish protocol by hosting these Gentiles and then being, by agreeing to be hosted in Caesarea by Cornelius, another Gentile. The next day, they then begin their two-day trip to Caesarea. By the time they arrive, Peter has had enough time to reflect on the vision from Joppa and come to an understanding of what it means because he immediately declares a conclusion to Cornelius and everyone else who's listening in verses 28 and 29. <coughs> Verse 28. You yourselves know how unlawful it is for a Jew to associate with or to visit anyone of another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any person common or unclean. So when I was sent for, I came without objection. I asked why you sent for me. Cornelius then repeats the story of his visit from the angel and invites Peter to tell him and his guests whatever God wishes. And that is how Peter ends up becoming the first Jewish Christian to preach the gospel of Christ to Gentiles. This gets us to the best part of the story and we are now going to be reading from Acts chapter 10 verses 34 to 46 and I'm going to be reading this from the English Standard Version um, but you can read it in whatever version that you prefer. Verse 34. Then Peter began to speak, I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. You know the message God sent to the people of Israel, and that's in the good news of peace through Jesus Christ who is Lord of all. You know what has happened through the throughout the province of Judea, beginning in Galilee, after the baptism that John preached. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil, because God was with him. We are witnesses of everything he did in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They killed him by hanging him on the cross, but God raised him from the dead on the third day, and caused him to be seen. He was not seen by all people, but by witnesses whom God had already chosen, by us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one whom God appointed as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. While Peter was speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on those who heard the message. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on Gentiles. 
for they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. Amen. Amen. This is a great story of grace and how Cornelius and his family met Jesus. I love how I love the fact how the Holy Spirit is already starting to work in this house before Peter even finishes his last word of his sermon. Peter speaks and God is already at work. They all encountered the grace of God. Cornelius grew up with paganism. Cornelius was probably empty from this and was a man searching for something. As Cornelius encountered Jesus and listened to Peter's message, he is then filled with the Holy Spirit and God's power. Have you ever looked at people and looking at the things they do and their actions and think they could actually be a good Christian when in fact they have no faith at all? Well, this is Cornelius in this story. He is doing everything right but does not have Jesus in his life. Cornelius thinks he's seeking God, but God is actually seeking him. The grace of God is evident in the beginning of Cornelius' story, but even before he met Jesus, the grace of God was already at work in Cornelius' life, and something is stirring in his heart. It's what we call in the church prevenient grace. Prevenient grace is God drawing us to him even before we know it yet. John chapter 6 verse 44 says this, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them, and I will raise them up on the last day. This is grace pulling us to Jesus. Some of you here may be praying for a family member or friend who doesn't know Jesus. Well, what one encouragement I can give to you, even if you don't remember anything else I say, is that God is already there, and He is already at work. I had the guy who I became friends with at youth group growing up back in Perth. He was the same age as me, and we would go to camps and weekends away and always share the same room. So I would spend a lot of time with him. My friend was from a non-church background and came to youth group for another friend at his high school. I didn't realize this at the time, but he told me many years later that I kept asking him to come to church on Sunday, Sunday evening, as we had Sunday evening at that time. And slowly and surely, at the right time, God pulled him to church on a Sunday. I had never directly led anyone to Christ on my own strength. But I was willing to let the Spirit work in the right time and with my friend's curiosity for him to come to Jesus. Now this guy is now a regular church goer now with his wife and family. But for those of us who aren't seeing any positives from our invitations or our prayers for people who do not know Jesus yet, we just need to be patient with God's time and not be frustrated with our own timing. God is always at work in the background, whether we see it or not. Now what does prevenient grace look like in our lives? Our pre-Jesus days, or one of my friends, Jack, would call it his BC days, before Christ days. God was reaching out to us before we even knew God was there. Sometimes God drew us through simple curiosity. Sometimes we were drawn by conviction. And sometimes we're just shown areas in our lives that we realize we are sinners. God draws us to himself by where we are and who we are doing life with. You thought your upbringing or your Christian friend was a coincidence. It's not. It's God already at work. His grace continues to draw and bring us closer to him, all the way to the point that we experience the saving grace. God's grace does not begin in the middle of our life story, but way back at the beginning of our life story. In Galatians chapter 1, verse 15, Paul wrote, But he, but when he who set me apart before I was born, and who called me by his grace, Wherever we are, whatever we are, wherever we are in our faith, wherever it's strong or weak, God is always pulling us towards Him. The grace of God is is calling and drawing you. Cornelius would be constantly bumped up against the lives of God's people. He was highly esteemed among the Jews, so he was no foreigner to the people of faith. Notably, when prevenient grace led him to a significant woman. Cornelius' first act of obedience was to seek the companionship of Peter, a Jewish Christian who he had never met. That is why discipleship is so important. Discipleship does not begin at the point of conversion. Discipleship happens all along the way of the journey of grace. Nurturing, fostering, and 
fueling the work that God is already up to in the person's life. Dan Boone, the president of Tribeca Nazarene University, said, Provenient grace invites us to take the trip, but provenient grace also prepares us and others for what God is doing. This is the activity of the Holy Spirit because God is drawing us. God is already at work in the world. He is already at work in the streets and homes outside. For being in grace isn't just for Cornelius, but that Peter was participating in it as well. As we go out into God's world, we should be on the lookout for those places where God's Spirit is already moving, so we can do our part. And we can respond to the grace of God today. And Cornelius gives us an, an excellent example in the story today. He invited Peter to come and speak to him, which was God speaking through Peter to him. So let us, in our own hearts, take a moment of silence and invite God to speak in our lives today. Lord, we thank you so much for the journey of grace that we get to be on with you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for convenient grace and how it brings us to you even before we realize it yet. And we pray, Lord, for our friends and for our family members who do not know you yet. And we pray, Lord, that we will be able to just trust in your timing and your will and your provision, um, that they may know Jesus and that may, they may celebrate him as their Lord and Savior. And we just pray, Lord, that you just speak into our lives today. And you fill us with your grace. You fill us with your Holy Spirit. So that we may be able to go out into the places that you give us opportunities to just share and invite people to the church. And we thank you, Lord, that you are a living hope that we can put in you today.